television show X-Files, at least season one, which we all suspected had some basis in reality, was, of course, based in part two the work that John D'Souza did. So, Mr. D'Souza, let's take you back to first talk about when you joined the FBI, uh, what year and what were the circumstances that made you decide that's the federal government agency that you're going to join as opposed to the clowns in America or the <laughs> no such agency or anything like that? Is when I joined the FBI as a special agent and uh, it was a, a great decision on my part uh, it was, uh, and it was based in part on something that had occurred just a short time, uh, short time before that. Uh, it was based on an incident that I had seen uh, great heroism and great, um, uh, amazing uh, uh, saving of innocent life. You know, very popular incident that was known as the Miami Shootout. And it happened, I believe it happened in 1985. Whoa. You can go, Wait, if anybody... <laughs> are you talking about the cocaine cowboy era in Miami? Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Except uh, this was going, uh, this uh, area of Miami-Dade uh, was going um, into experimental drugs uh, at the time, not just the regular old cocaine. They were uh, going into... Uh, drugs like um, angel, something called angel dust. PCP, <laughs> right? That's at yes, least what I yes. hear. That's it, yeah. what it was called. Uh, it was called PCP, angel dust. Uh, also, they called it horse tranquilizers. Um, although I don't know if it actually literally was horse tranquilizers. Uh, so that was what was starting to be popular in these poorer areas of Miami-Dade. And as a result... We had a, a couple of, uh, and this is what was called the Miami shootout. Uh, we had a couple of bank robbers. They were kind of hillbilly bank robbers. This was, uh, and like I said, this was the incident that inspired me to join the FBI. And we had a couple of these hillbilly bank robbers who were running around hitting all the banks. They were hitting all the banks and uh, coming away pretty successfully. They used uh, regular weapons, guns and shotguns. Okay, uh, and, here we uh, go. Guns of that sort, rifles of that sort and they basically would just go in and rob the banks and uh, get as much as they could and they were very successful at doing this until we had a bank robbery task force that had fbi agents and police officers on it and they ac they accurately predicted what the next bank was these guys were going to hit uh, by the way these guys were named maddox and platt Maddox and Platt. That was their names. And uh, they uh, accurately predicted kind of the where, what bank they were going to hit. And they had the entire task force waiting in that vicinity for these two guys. And they rolled up in a in an old dilapidated Chevy uh, that Turn they used. Turn left uh, and then continue these straight on. Bank robbers. They rolled up in that and immediately the Go straight uh, FBI on. task force uh, noticed who they were and where they were. Turn left. And they kind of ran them off the road, ran the Maddox and Platt off the road this is into where this ends. parking lot, into a sort of, yeah, it was a parking lot. And they kind of, they stopped their, they crashed their car in there. Uh, and uh, then uh, several other FBI vehicles converged on the spot. Uh, they all came out uh, and they all told Maddox and Platt to surrender and put their hands up and get cuffed up because they, they had them. They had them dead to rights. And so they, uh, Maddox and Platt, did not give up. Uh, instead, what they did was they grabbed all the weapons from their the from the floor of their cars, the, uh, from the running boards of their car, and the and the areas all around their cars. And they grabbed all the weapons and came out of their cars. And of course, they were immediately met with a barrage of bullets and fire from the FBI task force, and they were all shot to death. Except they didn't die. Ooh, okay. I was it armor, bulletproof armor, or something else well, was the reason that they didn't die. Well, you would think so. You would think so. However, it was later found that the only the only armor that Maddox and Platt had Time were t-shirts and flannel shirts and flannel shirts that were flapping in the wind and ball caps. They had ball caps on their head. Uh, that was it. That was all they had. And one of them was actually shot uh, right through. Uh, the aorta, Turn the aorta right. going to the heart, and uh, severed it severed the aorta. And, and yet, and generally, within left. sixty seconds, I would think 
some the, the made the biggest artery, right? Turn the left. one going in the yes. aorta. You would be yes. dead in 60 seconds if that was severed, right? Yes. As a matter of fact, the scientists told us because we do have FBI scientists, unfortunately, but they told us uh, that yeah, the usual estimate is 60 seconds to maybe 120 seconds that of life you would have left uh, when the aorta is uh, severed. However, like I said, these two guys, defying all expectations, uh, came out of their vehicles and they came out shooting. And they actually shot, uh, shot and, uh, and shot all the FBI agents. They did a semicircle in that parking lot and they shot all the FBI agents. Uh, there were several um, people who retreated. I'll just use the word retreated. They retreated uh, far beyond uh, the ability of Maddox and Platt to shoot them. Uh, but uh, there were several other FBI agents who were pinned down. Some were behind cover and pinned down uh, by Maddox and Platt who kept on shooting relentlessly. They were changing magazines like nothing ever happened to them, uh, even though they had both been shot uh, fatally through several areas. And uh, they basically uh, executed, I believe it was two FBI agents and shot the rest of them, uh, shot the rest of them uh, uh, non-fatally through uh, several places. Uh, and they continued to fire at uh, one particular FBI agent who was this big, uh, big burly uh, uh, Mexican dude. Uh, and he was pinned down uh, and he had actually had his right arm blown apart by a shotgun. Oh, jeez. So his arm was actually blown inside out. If you can imagine a, a shotgun, a shotgun, um, a shotgun piece of metal. What's that called? We have buck, and then we have uh, the solid piece of metal. Slug. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was slug. gonna say the yeah, slug. Yeah. So he had a piece. He had a slug that started up at his wrist and went down all the way down to the meat of his of his upper arm, oh. and basically blew that entire like a zipper it like an explosive zipper it blew open his arm inside out so it was laid out to the bone with the with the meat exposed as if a, a surgeon had just done that and so that arm was completely useless however uh, as Madison plot were using up all their ammunition uh, trying to kill everyone in that parking lot uh, and you know they were mostly hitting uh, hitting the cars that uh, people were using for cover uh, and uh, as they were shooting, uh, this uh, they basically finished using all their ammo, and then uh, they got into their car. They got into their car, and they they started their car up to get away. Uh, and as they were doing that, they, they were having problems because the car had taken so many bullets and shotgun shells uh, that it actually damaged the uh, transmission. So they were having a hard time starting the car so they could get the clean getaway. And as they were doing that. Uh, the uh, one agent that had been had his arm blown up, blown up inside out, used the other arm to fill up a shotgun, uh, put up, put six shells into a shotgun, and then I believe six, maybe five, uh, if to fill up the uh, HR Remington uh, 870 Get shotgun. Ready to turn and left. he filled it up, and then he took his uh, his pistol and also and put it in his belt, and then he he jumped up in front of the Turn car left. As, as the car was getting ready to leave the parking lot he got up he jumped up in front of that car and he shot into both Maddox and Platt he sh emptied the shotgun into both of them with one hand one arm and he was and then the shotgun was empty he threw it down he took his pistol and he finished uh, and he finished firing emptying the pistol into them he had actually successfully severed the uh medulla where the spine actually meets the skull the back of the skull uh and that was the only way he finally they finally were able to kill these guys because they wouldn't die and uh he did he severed the uh whatever that the spinal cord at the at the neck as it where it meets the brain and he did that on both of these guys and that's what finally stopped them now Nothing. as they were initially receiving uh gunshot wounds did the wounds themselves look and and did the, as the bullets passed through their body did they react like uh, another person say any of the fbi agents that were injured from their gunfire from uh, maddox and platt's gunfire did, did they no, look no. similar or did it just no. look 
different? Was the they, blood they the same color like or anything like that? They, I, I can't speak to how much blood they put out mm -hmm. uh, of their wounds, but uh, because that was never addressed by the forensic uh, examinations that were done. Uh, but, Go straight um, on. But yeah, I mean, they, they lost some blood, uh, but they acted like they had not been shot for the most part. I mean, um, uh, they, they basically took the fire and acted like nothing had happened. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a very uh, bewildering uh, part of this story. Uh, Did toxicology reports on them come back and say that they were on cocaine or... Yeah, but it, did, it didn't matter. Uh, mm -hmm. That didn't really matter because even before, uh, even before that occurred, I, 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 you're probably familiar with the term known as fake news. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well the uh, there was a tr when the, when that occurred and we had several FBI agents killed and terribly terribly injured. Uh, there was a there was a huge uh, amount of political pressure to find out how these guys had done this. Now, as I told you as I told you at the beginning, uh, this was a neighborhood that was known for uh, PCP. So, the uh, the FBI people involved, probably the higher ups, I would say, uh, basically made up a made up a narrative that these guys were on uh, PCP horse tranquilizers. Mm -hmm. They were both loaded to the gills with the horse tranquilizer uh, PCP angel dust, and that that was most likely the only way that these guys were able to do what they did, and that this would be uh, further proven by. Uh, by uh, toxicology tests, which take a little more time, you know, that's, that's going to take, uh, that would take a few weeks at least uh, Keep to come right. back. Uh, so they just created that narrative, and then the uh, mainstream media ran with that. The news put that everywhere. They put, oh, these uh, these two guys were able to do superhuman feats of strength and, and uh, stamina because they were loaded with PCP. Uh, with angel dust, uh, that's the only way this is humanly possible because they didn't have any body armor. This is this is the only answer. It's the only way, and this will be proven. And that basically, all the newspapers ran with that uh, with that narrative at that time. Now, then the toxicology test came back, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the toxicology test came back, and they they showed that Madison Platt had absolutely nothing in their system. They hadn't even drank. They hadn't even drunk a beer before uh, they uh, launched their latest uh, bank robbery. Wow. Uh, they had a little bit of tobacco, a little bit of nicotine from cigarettes. That was about it. That but, would uh, not be uh, responsible for them living beyond of what would normally. <laughs> now, if it would have been like, for instance, PCP, I've heard of people who were able to say uh, punch through a windshield of a car, break right. their hand, and. and a lot of other bones in their arm never feel anything. I've heard of things, pe people like getting shot a few times and, you know, until they lose enough blood to actually collapse, they're still up. But this, if they have nothing in their system other than some nicotine, that right there is shocking to me. Now, what, uh, I'm gonna ask you a one, which is actually two questions. Both, what was your own opinion of what these people, if they were people were, and then what did the FBI conclude uh, behind closed doors, what they were? Uh, behind closed doors, what the FBI concluded was that they would completely ignore Get ready to turn left. what occurred with Maddox and Platt. And they would basically focus on the heroism of that one agent that was finally turn able left. to bring them down and kill them. Uh, and that's what they did. They basically just pumped up that narrative of uh, this one agent being a great example of, of the great heroism of the FBI, and rightly so, they were right about that, absolutely. And, but they basically, uh, despite a great deal of political pressure to come up with an answer, uh, they basically just, just kind of ignored it and just kind of buried the whole thing about how Maddox and Platt were able to do what they did. Uh, they, they, just, they just came up with some alternate explanations. They had some, some FBI scientists give some, some garbage about how uh, 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 adrenaline can sometimes, some, kind of, some people have greater amounts of adrenaline than others. And they're able to create adrenaline rushes that are 
that give them great feats of strength, stuff like that. And it was it was just a bunch of nonsense. Uh, so, so that's what they did. And I was uh, I was, despite how much I was impressed by this by this incident when it occurred, and it actually motivated me to join the FBI in 1988. Uh, I was I was definitely I knew I knew even as an amateur investigator that uh, this was nonsense, that uh, the real story behind Max was something else. And then so when I right. got to the academy, so when I got to the FBI academy, I was accepted and I went. Uh, I, was a, I was an attorney. Right. I was an attorney who was accepted to the special agent position. I oh, so the, you're a fellow, J.D. Yes. Ah, I amen. Am. Dr. D. D. <laughs> J.D., yeah. yeah. Juris doctor. I am, that's what I am, yeah. Yeah, um, and so I went to uh, the FBI, I went to the academy, and when I got to the academy, I actually, there were some deputies there who were, had actually worked the case, had actually worked the uh, Maddox and Platt case, and I actually had a Go series of questions on. for them, uh, and I did ask them the questions about the Maddox and Platt case, and they, actually, they were able to tell me that uh, they were, they were um, sent to the uh, residences of Madison Platt to search for uh, search for PCP or some other drugs uh, that would which explain is kind it. of fruit, fruitless because if they didn't have it in their system then what would it matter if it's at their house I mean what are they going to convict oh. them for selling drugs after they're dead I mean yeah. it, it kind of is, seems like a waste unless that was the cover to get in their homes to see something else could have been it could have been um, and also, they can always they could always just say that the uh, the first series of testing uh, just didn't catch it, and uh, that uh, now um, now we know that uh, they probably did have this stuff in the system, uh, and you know they could they could fabricate just about anything if they really put their minds to it. So, but what the these deputies said to me that was very interesting was that they said the only thing that was odd that they found in the homes of these guys. Was they found these, um, they found these little altars mm -hmm. that were Odinist, Odinist altars uh, to Norse gods, and that they had some incense in there that they had burned, and it looked like the timing was it looked like the incense had been burned, and they had runes like Nordic runes and stuff like that, and it made it look Keep like right, they had actually done and then some turn kind of. Rock. Uh, sacrifice incense just before they went out for the last bank robbery, and the timing just lined up with that. Turn right. And that, they told me that's the only odd thing that they found, and so and, and they and they actually gave me um, the names of the Norse gods, I guess that were Go that straight were on. Uh, appearing there in that altar, and uh, it was and one of them was Loki, Loki, Loki. Uh, uh, the, yeah, Loki, the the trickster. Got yes. It. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so basically, uh, I I told those deputies, I said that's it. I said that's how they did what they did. Something came through to them when they were doing these rituals to these Norse gods, and they got some kind of. Some people tell me, oh, it was a berserker spirit. People who know a lot about <laughs> Norse mythology they know more than I do, and they. And they told me, well, they got some kind of berserker spirit that came through. Other people tell me they got something from from Loki, the uh, trickster god, uh, that was able to give them this superhuman ability, this superhuman ability to do what they did. But in any case, I believe I believe that that altar was the source of what they were able to do, regardless of how it came through. And so, I did. I told the uh, deputies about that, and uh, they were um, they were very interested in that. And uh, then shortly after that, I was uh, I was called in uh, by the the boss of our entire uh, of our academic of our class mm -hmm. uh, there at the FBI, because wouldn't you know, the boss of our FBI academy class was the one. FBI agent whose legacy had to be protected at all costs, who was the individual who actually shot down Maddox and Platt before they could kill anybody else. And so he was told everything 
about my conversation with these deputies. And he now he now believed that I was a New York Times reporter, you know, undercover. Oh, at, yeah, that's what he... At the FBI Academy. He told me he believed that. And he told me he was going to make sure I never graduate from this academy. He was very, very upset. <laughs> he was very upset as, uh, you know, people who are who are great idols uh, tend to tend to get when you disrupt when you threaten they perceive that their their legacy is being threatened and so i went through a very difficult time at my fbi academy after that um, and i was told by the higher-ups i would never graduate uh, from there and uh, however i was able to do some quick thinking on my feet and i was able to actually graduate from there and he was quite upset when he had to give me my credentials. <laughs> I would imagine so. <laughs> graduation. He was not happy at all. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, he, uh, when I got stationed in the field, uh, he actually called up my first office and he said to them, this, there's something wrong with this guy. He seems to like paranormal, uh, paranormal uh, cases. Uh, uh, so uh, make sure that you give him uh, plenty of paranormal cases and give them to them, uh, whether they're from your office or from other offices around the FBI. And we'll see how, how much he enjoys that. So would you say that, it, well, clearly it sounds like it was a, sort of a, I don't want to say task force quite, but I mean, unless that's what it was, but it sounds like it was geared toward because of what you had experienced in Miami with that shootout with Maddox and Platt, uh, is it Platt, right? Maddox and Platt? Yeah. Not, right. And not to mention the fact that you uh, obviously showed interest, which is what they picked up. So were you working alone on these paranormal cases, or did they actually have a team of you? No, I was, it was for the most part, it was uh, me alone. I, and by the way, I never worked the Maddox and Platt case in Miami-Dade. Uh, I, I just, um, it was just, that was an incident that occurred before I, uh, that inspired me to join the FBI. Uh, and and then when I when I went into the field and did receive some paranormal uh, cases, yeah, for the most part, I worked those things alone, uh, for the most part. But I often worked them with other agents as well. So you so, really were the real Fox Mulder in this, literally. Pretty much, pretty much, and uh, it was something that was uh, it was not a source of pride. <laughs> it was not a source of pride or anything of that sort. It was something uh, you were supposed to be ashamed of and kind of try to keep hidden, and uh, that's why a lot of the a lot of the cases were OTB. They were off the books. They were uh, things that other law enforcement officials don't like to deal with either, or politicians. Uh, they didn't like dealing with these sorts of things either, and so that's why a lot of these things were OTB. They were off the books. Once you were in the FBI and they essentially were assigning to you the paranormal cases that you kept off the books, what was the first major paranormal case you ended up researching or uh, investigating? Um, they, were, uh, they were the cases, well, let me put it this way. They were the cases that you see in the first season of X-Files. Those were the cases, uh, because right, uh, those were the cases that right. went into my OTB book, and those were the cases that uh, that I was not supposed to talk about. Turn uh, right. But because uh, Chris Carter put him into the X Files as fiction, he was able to talk about. It. He was able to expose what happened in those cases and and what occurred uh, during that first season, and. Uh, then um, and those cases basically had been had been taken uh, from me um, from my OTB book where I would take notes and, and write everything that occurred, and uh, that that uh, OTB book was given to or was taken by some FBI agents who were retiring to Los Angeles to consult with television shows, and they were able to share some of my stuff there, and so what occurred after the first season of the X Files in '93. Keep left. 1993. Uh, so what occurred, and Chris Carter talks about this uh, today, uh, was that uh, my bosses recognized my cases at first uh, on, at the first season of the X Files. Wow. I'll, I'll say it that way. Um, and so they they recognized my cases, and they were extremely upset, and they were also looking to punish me 
uh, because you know it's always it's Keep always uh, right. you always suspect whoever's on the scene, you know, uh, and so they uh, were ready to punish me for it. Uh, be, and I was able to tell them I did not give any Keep information left. directly to Chris Chris Carter at all. I never did. And so they called up Chris Carter. They got him on the. They got him, uh, and they uh, told him that uh, they were gonna they were gonna stop his show, put a stop to his show. Uh, the the see, FBI uh, threatened him really to stop yes. his show. Wow. Yes, they did. Uh, they told him uh, that he was obviously getting information from somewhere that uh, that uh, he's not supposed to, and that uh, they know about it, of course, um, and uh, they were going to uh, shut down his show and he would not be allowed to have his show on the air anymore. And uh, Chris Carter was very cooperative with them. Uh, he told them, he told them, hey, if I got something I'm not supposed to get, then I want to help you guys. Uh, just tell me the details of the, of the cases that you're talking about. Tell me, you know, what cases you're talking about you know, during season one. Uh, and, <laughs> and I will track down what's going on what's happening with all this and uh and then uh they questioned him about if any fbi agents who were currently on duty because i was there <laughs> they were talking about me uh had given him the information for the first season of the of the x-files and he was able to say absolutely not and i was able to say the same exact thing uh, that i was not i was not uh in any in any form giving him information for these this first season of the x-files and so they basically told chris carter okay then uh, we can't really give you give chris carter any more information to to do a cross check uh so we'll just call it a day there uh we'll all go back to our corners and you can just continue with your show that's it um and uh and that was that was it after that uh and Unfortunately, the entire um, the FBI knew that I had been uh, called in for that, and as a as a result, they started after that they started calling me the X Files guy, X Files man, oh, or wow. X Man for X Man for short. Agent so X this, or that too is that is that I think I've read something uh, referring to you as Agent X. Is that pro correct? Uh, well, what I see everywhere is John D'Souza, the X Man. X, uh, literally, uh, instead of uh, Stan. Uh, God, why am I blanking on the name? Instead of Marvels, um, uh, why is Stanley's last name? Anyway, uh, you are the real X Men as opposed to the Marvels X Men. Anyhow, let's. I think this is an important detail that we need to tell the uh, people that are paying attention to this interview. You kept a journal off the books detailing each of these cases that you investigated in the paranormal field, right? Yes, most of them. And that was somehow, was it lost by you or misplaced? But regardless, did that not end up in Chris Carter's hands? I believe it did, yes. And what are the circumstances around you uh, realizing it's gone or losing it? Uh, I just had, I was not very happy, but I knew right away what had happened. Um, Someone because, stole it? Or is it just that yes. you missed? Oh. Yes, it was. It was taken by uh, by a couple of retired uh, agents who, who just went to Los Angeles to consult with television shows. So, th okay, because they were consulting with television shows, they took your paranormal off the book journal of real cases that you were investigating and yes. ended up giving it to Chris Carter, I'm assuming, so they could also get paid on the extra for being consultants on X-Files? Yes, exactly. Wow, that's, wow. That's exactly what I believe happened. And uh, that's what it looks like to me, especially from when I look at the uh, the first season of The X-Files and see that, uh, see what happened there, and what details they used. Uh, it was like a, a, a very embarrassing biography of my, of my life. Because if you look at all those episodes in the first season, they were, they were, they did not put me or the agent in a good light. They, uh, and they were highly, highly embarrassing at that time. So that's basically all I felt. But, I mean, after the first season was over, they went on to the other seasons. Uh, they used other materials, too, for the most part. They, they still use some, of, some things from my book as well. Here, here's a question in the chat that I'm going to ask because it's uh, 
related to what we're talking about. Normally I reserve the last uh, 30 minutes or so and since I told you an hour or an hour and a half, we're definitely gonna go towards the hour and a half uh, so far based on this and maybe a That's little cool. longer, but we'll go. We'll take it by the time. Okay, this is Keep from right Hypnotic. And then hip, exit right. Hypnotic Eyes and it says, if it was that important, how did it get stolen so easy? Exit right. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, that's a good question. Well, you know, um, here's let me tell you something about FBI. Turn agents right and, and then uh, keep right. And people who work intelligence in general, uh, they tend to believe keep that right. wherever they're wherever they are tends to wherever they're working tends to be a secure space. Let's put it that way, a secure space uh, because they tend to believe that the people in their own organization are trustworthy. Finding so a new route. Oh, it got stolen because I was I was uh, silly enough at that time. I was, I was relatively new uh, to the FBI at that time. Uh, and uh, I was foolish enough to believe that uh, all FBI personnel could be trusted. Let's put it that way. And you know what? And sadly, that's okay. generally Let's what we were route. all taught up is, you know, I, I would think Turn someone's right. from the FBI, CIA, or LAPD, I was raised to trust them and believe them. But as oh. we've all known, oh. that is not necessarily <laughs> the truth. As a matter of fact, after we're done, I'll even tell you some people who we know in common, which clearly have found out to be not trustworthy. But that's a different oh. angle. Uh, let me throw a quick shout out here to Pyramid <laughs> 7. Pyramid, thank you for your super chat and your support. Never mind. And, I'll find uh, a new route. Saying it's a great show, and I will pass on the message to Make Mr. a YouTube. Pyramid 7 nice. wants to say hello to you. Uh, okay, now, uh, because I could only pull up right now in front of me uh, the actual episode list of season one. Oh, there's another super chat and that is my dear friend Rockstar. Rockstar, I want to thank you as well for the super chat and also for showing me some amazing footage. Oops. Rockstar, for everyone out there, has been showing me great footage of what I think are legit portals, which we were, are going to do a show about that coming soon, everybody. Dude, so. call me for that show because portals are part of my thing. Oh, well, hell, you know what? Near the end, after we get through some of this, we could actually talk about a little bit of that. And, and after we finish, I will talk to you about bringing you on for that day. Turn I think right. you would be a great asset considering of your experience literally investigating uh, paranormal, including things like portals which interest you and you have uh you know a lot of credibility in this so i think that would be fantastic to have you involved when we do a show on that now because i'm able to only look at the title of the episodes i if i'm not mistaken there was an episode i believe it to be season one where there is a live alien captured and at the very end Mulder, it's like it's in it's like, uh, I want to say it's in this, I don't know, I'm, I'm just guessing dimensions here. 10 by 10, um, like a metal sort of room within like a gym area. And just as Mulder is going to go up to look at the window in the door to look at the alien, the smoking man, the cigarette smoking man stops him. Um, again, I don't know the name of that episode. It has been decades since I've seen it. But was that season one? Where there yeah, that's uh, the Erlingmeyer flask. Okay, now can you tell us how that case played out in reality? What year? Uh, uh, all that? Where? In the well, world? Um, well, I'm not. I'm not telling you how it played out in reality. What I'll tell you is what happened in the show episode that was that was real. Okay. Uh, there's a difference. Yeah, <laughs> it may of not course. sound like a difference, but there is. One's Hollywoodized. One's reality. Keep left. And also and one doesn't violate left. my uh, my NDA, ah, my yes. non-disclosure agreement, and the other one does not. Uh, so Turn here's left. what was here's what was real uh, in the show, the, from the show. Uh, it, there was an actual uh, there was an actual uh, container that was given to us, given to given to me uh, from a very uh, famous a very famous scientist. Go who straight on with. Uh, We'd worked with Area 51, Area 51, I believe it's called. Oh, are you uh, talking about Bob Lazar? 
No. Okay. I am not. I, I'm talking about. Actually, I'm talking about another person who is a, a very a famous person, uh, Boyd Bushman. Yes, yes, that was the second person I was thinking of. Um, it's ironic because some people wanted to, you know, debunk him, but my personal opinion is if someone's about to die, are they really going to show you pictures of hoaxes or anything like that and come up with this elaborate story when they are literally among their deathbed? And, and just to clear this up, and John, you know this as well as I do because you're an attorney. Most people don't understand deathbed confession. When a dying declaration is said, you, people cannot just assume that's the truth because dying declarations are only admissible in court if they have to go with regards of how the death is occurring. For instance, if you're shot right before you pass away, paramedics come and they say, a DJ shot me. That is admissible as a dying declaration. If as you're shot and the paramedics are working on you, right before you slip away, you say the moon is made of cheese and the world is flat, sorry folks, that does not count as a dying declaration. So I just wanted to clear that out there because <laughs> other people assumed that it all is dying declaration, no. But I do stand by that if you're about to die, are you really going to show something that is not true? Now the other question is, is did Boyd Bushman believe it to be true, but it actually was false what he was showing? I mean, that is up for debate, but I don't think personally he would create this elaborate lie. And I personally think Boyd Bushman did work at Area 51, if not in S4. So anyhow, so I didn't do I. mean to interrupt. Yeah, perfect. So we're both on the same page as that. And he did produce some really astound astounding photos. So tell go on and tell us now before I cut you off uh, to where we were with regards to you telling us about Boyd Bushman. So this uh, uh, this individual was able to uh, give us a uh, container, a container uh, that looked similar to the one that was shown on the show. And it was... He's right, and it then was turn containing, right. It had an ink kind of, an ink-like consistency to it. So I couldn't really see inside of it. I, I couldn't really see what was inside of it. Turn it appeared right. to be something that would be the, the size of a small... Uh, it could have been like a fetus. Let's put it that way. It could have been the size of a small fetus. Uh, and it was... And he actually told us that it was an alien artifact that would change the history of the world. Oh, okay. I'm thinking Project Yellow Book or something like that, or maybe something that can show us how anti-gravity can be done. Uh, can you say it without violating the NDA? Turn left. Uh, say what? What what it was that would have changed uh, our literally everything we can do on this planet with that technology? Well, all I all I can say is that I I do believe him what he told me. Uh, what he told me at that time that it was an alien artifact. Get ready uh, because to turn I could left. not see for sure, and I definitely had no ability to open it. <laughs> so, uh, not that I would anyway. Uh, but turn uh, left. I was told it was very important evidence, and we were going to transport it to our FBI headquarters, and uh, that's what we that's what we did. So now, th that episode was. That's partly based on uh, what you did. Where so, was there a live extraterrestrial that you could tell us, or was that part of the fictionalized part that Chris Carter made? I was told later that there was. I was told later that there was, uh, and that came from uh, that came from a couple of different sources. But like I said. I was not able to myself uh, be able to look inside of that thing and be able to know exactly what we had. Wow. And can you tell us where this location was or is that restricted? The location? Yeah. Of, of what? Of where that being was held or was it at S4 or Area 51? Uh, yes, I was told it came out of, it came out of that S4 area. Now, I'm assuming as a member of the FBI, you had no access to Area 51, even though you were investigating paranormal, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, because I, I mean, I know uh, a Let's story that Eisenhower, I believe it was 54 or maybe after. I, I, I think it was 54 because he, he was after he was president. He was denied access in the Area 51, and he even threatened to bring in, I forget which brigade uh, involved uh, the or the infantry group that didn't have the tanks, but essentially he invade it threatened to invade Area 51 if they wouldn't let him in, and I don't know what the outcome of it was, except that we know there wasn't a war on American soil between troops uh, in the army and, of course, whoever's guarding the um, S4 and the whole Area 51 proper facility, and not just that Area 51, 52, 54, and basically the whole uh, Nevada test site. Now, let's go through some other cases. I have the episode list. Um, actually, I'll just ask you, uh, based on your memory, it doesn't even ha you don't have to have to say the names of the episodes, but tell us a couple more that stick out in your head of other types of paranormal cases uh, before we come back to some more UFO cases that you investigated. So, uh, aside from the one we just talked about involving Boyd Bishman, which is one of your favorite that you wrote about that ended up being adapted into X-Files season one? Well, favorites in, in terms of, um, <laughs> favorites in terms of something that I, I actually liked. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Like liked. the crazy um, paranormal, like the, uh, <laughs> The two Pine Miami guys, uh, um, Maddox yeah. and, and Platt, the people that just wouldn't die and possibly had yeah. something yeah. else going I on. I would say it's the one about. Um, I would say it's the one about Mr. Graves, um, where they actually dealt with a uh, serial killer that uh, we had dealt with, who was a very uh, malevolent uh, individual, who had uh, really safe. strange signatures for killing people. And we were able to, at one point, and they basically took this this pretty small incident that occurred uh, with our uh, with our task force, and was ultimately labeled paranormal. Uh, but um, but there was there could have been some argument as to whether it was or not. Uh, and basically, was a, it was a serial killer who always had uh, a special way of Get killing people right. and then removing an organ from their bodies. And we didn't. We never knew what he did with those organs. As a matter of fact, we right. never did catch him. Uh, we never did catch him. And uh, he basically went into. He was being chased by our our task force uh, through a building, and he basically went into a went into a locked room, and he had Get ready no to other turn way right. out of that because the window was sealed. The window was sealed to the outside, uh, and. The only Turn thing right. that occurred in that room, and but he disappeared. He absolutely disappeared. And I, I think in the show they call him Mr. Tombs. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, that's exactly, yeah. uh, you're right, T-O-O-M-S. Yeah. That's what they labeled him as. Right. And it was, and what we found in that room ultimately was a, just a grate, a grating that uh, that had a, Get that ready was just, to turn it was left. too small for a human being, basically. It was a grate. And the grate had what I call, what I call ectoplasm all over it. Turn left. Uh, this sort of horrible mucusy sort of material, and I, I touched some of it and I went through it, and it was disgusting, and so they, uh, so we started saying that he went through that grate somehow. Well, the only way he could have gone through that grate was if he was some kind of shapeshifter. And was able to make himself into what a snake, maybe, some kind of a snake, and, and go through that. And um, so that was that was just put down as undetermined, undetermined. And then later we found out that uh, the murders that he had done, they just they just stopped, they just stopped. And we did some research and showed that very similar murders. The thing about serial killers is that they have their own unique signatures. And so if you want to research what a so what a serial killer is up to all you have to do is go through the newspapers and look for his signature and it looked like this this particular murderer had killed people like every 30 years and then would stop 
and then we'll start again. Wow. And throughout the history, uh, throughout the history, going even into ancient history, uh, because we had to we had to research the microfiche as well uh, into going into the old days, and uh, I've done that several times, more than once with other paranormal phenomena as well. Now, I, I'm assu- like literally, this person pulled a Houdini and just was gone. Well, not literally, because he had to, there had to be some physical way that he got out of that room. And the only way that I could see was through that grate where he had left that horrible ectoplasm. And so that's why my final determination was, you know, if you eliminate, you eliminate everything else, I mean, the only explanation is impossible. And yet it appeared to be that that's what happened, that he somehow uh, changed his shape and went through that grating, through that grate, I should say. Wow. And so literally this egg. person was a shapeshifter, in essence. That's in yeah. what we're describing in modern terms. Yeah. I, I, I Literally, if I had to go investigate that, I, I can't imagine what I would think after go I straight on. realized, okay, there's a, a grate that's... Keep right, and, seeing, and like, then turn right. or anything like that, I would definitely, uh, my mind would be in another dimension. Let's just say that. Yeah. Turn right. Yeah, and, and that's the way it is. And it's not, it's not fun. It's not fun for a person in law enforcement to have to be coming to these conclusions and then try to share those, and then try to share those uh, conclusions in, at law enforcement. So at least in the first season of The X-Files, they really captured that aspect of it, the aspect of how difficult it is to be that spooky Mulder who, who gets that uh, reputation for uh, believing, for believing in way out stuff and, and trying to share these conclusions and being told, there's no way you can share that stuff. You cannot send that back to, back to headquarters. There's no way we will not sign that out. We will not sign that piece of paper. To send that to Washington, no way. So that that spirit of it, they really did capture that uh, perfectly in the first season of the X Files. There's a, I want to throw a shout out to Alex Olian. Thank you, Alex, for your super chat and of course support keeping this channel alive and of course for everything you've shared with me off the air and motivation. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Alex, and for everybody else that's shown support and is here in the chat room. As a matter of fact, I also see Third Phase of Moon. My Blake and Brent, straight from oh, Hawaii. Man. Yeah, Those my mentors, great friends. And literally, now that we are in 2021, it's nine years this month that I really was paying attention to their video. And after I saw that Robert Bingham video, when he was going to do the live uh, UFO summoning, which was May 2012, that will be the nine years from when I started working with them. So, they got a question for you, and it says, uh, word for word, I'm going to read it to you. Can you ask John if he expects any hard evidence coming from a government that they're in possession of an alien body? Good question. Alien yeah. Body. Um, are they are they talking about Keep the six right. month count? And uh, then in your opinion, right. are they talking about the six month countdown that uh, came out supposedly not quite um, right. i think in general like for instance you just talked about that episode where i mm-hmm. you know that alien was uh, you know right. being held at s4 mm-hmm. uh, right. you know is there anything like do you ex- well, uh, you know what whether it's going to come out from now until june or in general What's your opinion? Uh, do you think that they're ever going to show us any evidence that they do have an alien in their possession still? Mm, not really. I, I don't believe that they will. Uh, but if they do, if they do show show an alien body, it will basically be a lie. It will basically be a lie, and I'll explain why. I I, I wrote. An entire book called the extra dimensions and the reason I wrote that book was to uh, put forward my understanding after having worked all these cases uh, that uh, that alien visitors 
appear, according to evidence, they appear not to be physical, really. Not to be physical. Uh, they are actually, for the most part, non-physical. And they uh, sometimes, they sometimes have helped to create these crashes, like Roswell. Mm -hmm. And they have created these uh, Roswell crashes for purposes of, sometimes it's for purposes of passing on technology. Ah, uh, and, I, I, and for purposes of passing on these hybrid bodies also that they create. Uh, so that's why I say, uh, and these are these hybrid bodies are, are created by them uh, to give us a, a hope that they are physical as well. That's part of what they do. And, that's, uh, and they have very good reasons for doing that. It, uh, and that's why I say it would be a lie. You know, I'm, I'm actually really glad that you brought up the fact that uh, crashes like Roswell and other crashes were essentially to give us technology because this, yeah. I first heard Whitley Strieber talk about this, then George Knapp, and then recently my dear friend and former co-host uh, from years ago, Preston Dennett, which everyone here knows, uh, that essentially the reason why after there is a crash they don't come back and pick it up is so they can sort of leave us technology the same way we leave like a pickaxe for that last Amazonian that where all his tribe is left but him. We leave it in his trail so he can to help sort of help him along as if they want us to uh, speed up our technological advances. And also when you talked about the yes. fact that they are not really here like interdimensionally, I've heard a lot from contactees and abductees that they may be 80 percent in another dimension and 20 percent here which is why you could literally see through them is that what you're that's sort of a good implying? way that's a very good way of describing it uh that's a very good way of describing it yeah because i sometimes have a hard time articulating to people what the reality of this is and, and because the reality of all this is uh is portals and non-physicality of alien visitors and even even the partial even the non-physicality of genuine ufos that's why that's another reason why we know that genuine ufos do not crash they don't just crash they're not because alien visitors are not like us they don't just lock themselves into these tin cans and then just sail across the galaxy that's that's something that humans would do yeah. and it's what alien visitors do and the first place that i that i learned that that is the case is from an FBI document that is very well known, uh, that is very well known in these circles, and it was became much even more popular after after I wrote my book, The Extra Dimensions. Before I get to a couple more questions from Third Phase of Moon, are you talking about the document that was, I don't know who the author was, but it was given to, at least the receiver was uh, Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, and I think it referred to uh, four crashes, one in San Antonio in 1945 of May, and then the three different sites in Roswell. Is that the one you're referring to, or is it another no. one? No, it is not. I am talking about the smoking gun document. The smoking gun document, which came out Keep left. Uh, right about the time that Roswell happened. And it was a document that was written by an FBI agent who has, and this is why this is such a hidden document that people don't want. Uh, well, at least the, uh, the powers that be do not want us to look at this document at all. Uh, and they, they, and so Roswell Keep left. had incredible timing when the Roswell crash happened because it happened just at the time that this FBI agent released this, uh, released this, it's called a memorandum of importance dated July 8th, 1947. Oh, and literally the day after, or the I think that was the day of the newspaper that said from the Roswell Daily Record that they captured a flying saucer, I, right? Yes. Wow. Yes. He's left. Okay. yes. And, and one of the reasons that the, the distraction was made so big from this document, uh, because, I mean, just imagine it. What's, what would be in the news if an FBI agent releases uh, the news that he has an informant who is an alien visitor? Ha! Huh. <laughs> an alien visitor, and that this informant has given him several uh, has given him about eight conclusions that are true that he is giving to him uh, right at that moment so that he can publish it to the world, and that's what the smoking gun is. It's called a memorandum of importance, 
and it is uh, it is shocking shocking document and it is the one that says to us uh, it says that his informant told him his informant is uh, what was the word that he uses his informant is uh, no, he didn't say paranormal he said supernormal that's it he said his informant is a supernormal into a creature and uh, old supernormal is just an old-fashioned way of saying paranormal and uh, he says uh, for so for this reason and this FBI agent was a scientist himself um, as some FBI agents are and so he was writing this to the scientific community because in 1947 uh, scientific community was asking everybody what's going on with all these UFOs apparently there was a huge wave of UFOs across the world uh, in 1947 uh, not just Roswell uh, so he was he said I have an informant uh, who is super normal and who has given me this information uh, he says uh, alien visitors are here on a peaceful mission they are basically trying to find out uh, they are they are human like but they can appear much larger in size um, and there's there's things like he's referring to shapeshifting uh, but in the language of the time that's this is the best way he could describe it he also says ufos uh, don't have anyone inside of them they are actually uh drones right remote yeah uh he says remote control uh but i but I have come to believe that uh, genuine UFOs are possibly alive in some sense as well. Uh, and uh, he uh, also says basically that uh, F, uh, alien visitors, true alien visitors and true UFOs are not from our physical universe. They are coming here from other dimensions. They are not physical. They are not physical. That's the biggest revelation he has in this one page document. And he says, uh, they uh, possibly can achieve physicality or appear to be physical for short periods of time, but they cannot remain so. And they ultimately disappear back to their own dimension of space. They come from a different uh, locus, different level of existence, different dimension. And uh, these, he says these things and many others. Uh, he also says, uh, do not challenge these uh, UFOs because if you do, uh, the results will be, uh, will be very embarrassing very embarrassing to you uh, basically and he says this and several other things however uh, in 1952 just a couple of years later we see that the uh, entire United States Air Force uh, challenged a bunch of UFOs over over Washington DC is that and, why they flew over the Capitol building twice in a week at that time yeah at that time in 1952 yeah uh, they uh, had but this incident occurred in 1952 over over 14 days and it was many many ufos that, that sailed over the capitol building and uh, that part of washington dc and the uh, u.s air force was sent out after them and just what ha just what it says in this document happened this, what this document said would happen did happen the entire u.s air force was terribly embarrassed by these ufos that did uh, that did um that did uh, side by sides with them did uh, loop-de-loops around them uh, did backwards, backwards, uh, backwards accompaniment with them, and just a terrible, terrible embarrassment uh, to our to the United States Air Force that was documented and was uh, actually reported by the uh, was the uh, general uh, the commission report that occurred after this. They actually admitted all these things happened, and that was the last time that an entire air force was sent out after UFOs. It never happened again after 1952. What occurred? in Washington, D.C. Not to mention after the order to shoot them down and we lost a lot of planes and pilots, I would think then it was kind of uh, fruitless to try to even engage in these craft. Um, anyhow, let me get to the other questions that uh, Third Phase of Moon has asked here and whatever else questions people in the chat. Okay, uh, again from Blake and Brett, Third Phase of Moon. Any government in particular might reveal or disclose, and this is in reference to this countdown. Any government yeah. around the world? Yeah. Uh, well, I see things. I think I see things revealed in uh, in Japan all the time, uh, and this occurs on a regular basis. 
As a matter of fact, I've been spending some time with them uh, because they are they are revealing things uh, all the time from uh, both from the people and uh, and from their government. And I find it a lot. I, I find that stuff a lot more credible than um, the stuff I see coming out of the United States uh, because. Unfortunately, the United States is in the grip of this um, this group that is pushing that is pushing this uh, what we call fake alien fake alien disclosure, and it is not real. It is based on uh, on false uh, false facts, and but they have the media on their side. Uh, so for that reason, for so for that reason. Uh, people pay great attention to it and uh, it's uh, very unfortunate so we need people to be able to intervene and to investigate these things and be able to tell people what's really going on well thankfully there are people like us and third phase of moon that and you know our Jaime Masson who works with Keep us left. which hopefully we are making a dent but it would be nice if we had the mainstream media I have uh, yes. one more message to pass to you from Third Phase Moon, which I know you're going to like to hear, which is tell John we would love to have him on the team and come on board anytime. So, yes, please join uh, me with Third Phase of Moon, and we will do far more than tonight. And oh, that'd be awesome. As, yeah, as Go I even told on. you prior to, um, I know this was going to be a fun interview, so this is not the only one we will have. Now, there was a question. Let me find it back because I do not want to that question it was some good one um i could actually ask you the question and hopefully the person who wrote it okay well no it wasn't johnny vegas he actually responded andy cowley asks are there men in black yes absolutely there are in yeah, your opinion are they human that are trying to cover this up or as some people suggest that they are ets or ultra beam, go straight on from another dimension wherever they come from that are projecting the image of being human and some people go as far as to say that they are wearing human skin uh, to the point yeah. where their eyes are bigger they have no eyelashes no eyebrows uh, no hair or anything like that and so I've heard that both ways so what's your opinion Do, are they a part of the federal government that is there to silence us or are they literally no. they're, they're not us not at all no they are I, I believe they are in some way they are working um, um, with what we call what we call the cabal the, uh, the uh, powers that believe that they are ruling the earth and they use and they are in an uneasy alliance kind of with malevolent alien visitors uh, and so they uh, have these men in black who are out there to collect any any hint of alien technology or alien artifacts uh, whatsoever and to erase the memory of that from any humans uh, that have them at all uh, and uh, they are they appear to me I mean from the encounters that I've had uh, they appear to me to be some sort of reanimated corpses yeah, exactly. That's one of the, at least Dan Burrish and his wife did say that they seem to literally be wearing the bodies like you would wear clothes of dead people. Yeah, yeah. And they appear to be giving off radiation of some kind as well. Uh, so you cannot be exposed to them for very long or you'll get really sick. Wow. Uh, now, I have one interesting thing I've heard from people have actually seen the men in black and specifically the cars that they drive not one person who has seen that black sedan that they have can recognize what car it is it's almost as if it does not exist on this planet outside of them driving it's not a ford it's not a chevy it's not a lamborghini it's not a lincoln but it's something that literally cannot be uh d d cannot be not defined, but uh, recognized as anything on this planet. Well, yeah, but that's not a that's not a problem of the car itself. That's a problem of 
memory. It's this ability that they have to uh, erase memories, erase memories, uh, and to fog up memories. Uh, and apparently they have that ability, and alien visitors have that ability also, apparently. Uh, that's, that's what erases the car type and erases other stuff as well. Now, I'm sure you heard of General Ished's announcement, the uh, former Israeli, I guess you want to say, leader of the space program of Israel for about 30 years, a mm -hmm. retired professor who in December said that uh, essentially extraterrestrials are real, that uh, and Trump was on the verge of announcing that we are not alone and that they are non-human I guess we want to say ultra dimensional whatever they are non-humans working with American astronauts in a base underground in Mars and that this was no joke and when he refers to aliens he's not talking about migrants from another country but actual mm -hmm. literally non-terrestrials did you hear that statement when he made it Yes, yes, I did. And what was your opinion? Because obviously, from what I gather, this guy's not senile. A good no. friend of mine, Jeremy Canyon Lockyer Corbell, who everybody Go straight on. probably knows now, who made the Bob Lazar documentary, Bob Lazar, you are flying saucers, or Bob Lazar, Area 51 and flying saucers. He interviewed the person who interviewed Ished, since Ished doesn't speak uh English, just Hebrew, and was able to confirm everything that I just said that Ished was referring to extraterrestrials. So if Ished said this five years ago, it would have been laughed at. It would have been a National Enquirer Keep or if the, World mm. Weekly, the Weekly World News was still around. Right. That's where it would appear. But no, right. this made it the world over. You saw it on yeah. every major network in every newspaper because it had touched the pulse of people. And I, that was one of the reasons I thought, okay, in December 2017, you had the Navy footage first leaked before four years, three years later, they confirm it. And I think we're living in a new era. Personally, to me, after I first saw the Navy DOD footage of the Tic Tac gimbal and Go Fast, I thought that was the closest to disclosure we were going to get. Now, in light of that, do you think that by the end of this 180 day period which will be june we are actually going to see more videos and possibly some ets that you said it's going to be alive whatever they show us or are we just yeah. going to get more bs old documents maybe some photos from the 50s which we assumed exist but aren't really there i mean I, have you ever heard of when gordon cooper was I believe at Homestead Air Force Base or one of those bases and he filmed a, a flying saucer land and uh, and he never got to see the film projected but as he developed the film he held it up and was able to see it before it was shipped off to DC and never seen again. Do you think we're going to actually see videos like that or in your personal opinion Go what are on. we going to see? by the end of June and in July. Uh, I think it's very possible that they will bring out uh, these um, <clears throat> these uh, alien hybrid bodies that are uh, you know, that uh, same, similar to the ones that came out of Roswell, uh, Roswell crash. Uh, and uh, they'll probably see, you know, and we may see uh, genuine looking uh, UFOs as well. Uh, and some kind of, some kind of, uh, this attempt to uh, put forward uh, uh, this sort of fake disclosure that they're working on so hard right now. That's what I believe. I believe we'll see it. We'll see it all, basically. Uh, we'll see it all, uh, but again, but it will be a lie because this disclosure is being done by the Cabal and their allies uh, in the malevolent alien visitors that work with the Cabal. The deep state, deep state cabal. That's what yes. I think of when I hear. Yes, it. if well, what I think of is the smoking man, uh, who was a, a character that I lived uh, with. Yeah, the at, Mar the cigarette the smoking man in X Files. Yes, and you know, so for me, uh, the smoking man who goes straight uh, on. I call him Milsud in my in my materials, uh, and uh, it was, it, the cabal is basically 
him times a hundred, uh, and that's that's who they are, and that's and they want to control everything, and they work with the malevolent alien visitors who are against us and who are trying to fool us and who show us these hybrid bodies and say, yeah, there you go, the alien visitors are physical. Yeah, here's a crashed uh, UFO. See, we're we're just like you. Aliens are just like you. They're they're just they put themselves in tin cans and the tin cans just crash. Hmm. There you go. That's what they do. Here is another question, and uh, I'm gonna read it, and I'm gonna give you a little backstory of my part about it, and then I'm gonna get your opinion. If I need to read it again, I will. Okay, this is from Eddie Gomez. I guess I could tell you about uh, my part before I ask it. Uh, he's gonna ask about uh, Richard Doty. Now, real quick, are you familiar who with Richard Doty is? Uh, it's a name I've heard a lot. Okay. He, he was in the Air Force Office of Special Investigation. The documentary Mirage Men was based on him. Uh, he basically was uh, le leading in the disinformation with regards to ETs. Now, when I interviewed him, uh, a couple things that I was able to get from him was that there was an actual extraterrestrial event that happened at Kirkland Air Force Base in the early 80s. And since he was Air Force's Special Investigations, him and about 20 or so other members that were in his group were flown to Area 51 and given a, a shown a 20-minute briefing by a full bird colonel, and they were saw you know footage going back to the 40s all the way up to the 60s, which showed uh, bodies, living, dead craft, and then after they had about 45 minutes Q and A before they were brought back to Kirkland Air Force Base. During that interview. He did say that about a minute of that 20-minute footage that he was shown uh, at Area 51 was released, and uh, it's about the show's ETs. I said during the interview, are you referring to the Skinny Bob footage? He says, Go I don't know, on. I have to see it. After the interview, I texted to him while we were still talking. He saw it and said, yes, this is it, except some of it was, uh, you know, like the human, and it was cropped out of one of the images. For those of you who are wondering what the skinny bob footage is, it's what you're seeing right now as I am playing it. So he was able to confirm that that was real and because I had already shown that same footage to a ton of people who have had abductions or contact and said, if there's any footage on. of ETs that look similar to the ones that you interacted with, with, what would it be? Skinny Bob, I've heard from six different people. So to me, the fact that I had confirmation on both sides is why I give a lot of uh, credit to Richard Doty, even though he admitted to being part of the uh, disinformation while he was in the Air Force Office of Special Investigation. So that is my history with Richard Doty. That's my opinion, and now you know who he is. The question is from Eddie Gomez. What does John think of Richard Doty's interviews that he has been doing on Gaia lately? Is it pure disinformation? I would not say, um, I would not say pure disinformation. Go straight on. Uh, people, even people who are assigned to give uh, uh, disinformation uh, tend to use items that are true, items that are real, and then they'll mix, mix their own uh, material into it, uh, and um, you know, I don't want to specify uh, specify uh, anyone in particular, but uh, but yeah, I I believe that uh, whatever information uh, Richard Doty gives, uh, it uh, probably has items of truth in it, no matter what. Like the Skinny Bob, mm -hmm. you know, the Skinny Bob uh, videos, which appear appear like a big likelihood of uh, authenticity uh, just from having seen it. And so, you know, but then they'll they'll mix in their own uh, their own agenda into it, and uh, put it forward that way. And by doing something like that, by uh, you, this is the best way I was able to describe disinformation to people: is you take a big truth and surround it by a bunch of little lies, or you take the inverse: take a giant lie and surround it by a bunch of little truths and spit it out that way. That way. Yeah. And that works, right? That's what they essentially do. Yeah. Because if it has some truth to it, then they could, with because the lies are associated, then they just discredit it in full. Isn't that how agencies work? Yes, yes, that's how they work, and uh, it's uh, it works very well on the public, so that 
so that when you have the uh, when you have the cabal, let's say the deep state, uh, has uh, something that they want to really really cover up, uh, like let's say secret space program. Mm -hmm. Let's say that, just as an example. So what will they do to cover it up? Well, they'll come up with these uh, these individuals who claim to be whistleblowers from the secret space program, and they'll say, and they'll have you know some real items of truth in everything that they say, uh, but they'll be making up a bunch of garbage along with it. So now you have all these people who are out there talking about secret space program and covering it with a lot of sewage as well, and that people know it's not true. Uh, so what that does is it seals up the topic forever, like in a tomb, like in a crypt, where no one will ever believe anything about the secret space program ever again, you see? And it's very, very effective. That goes back to old uh, CIA mind tricks as well and programs. What is your opinion on Solar Warden, which was supposed to be the program for secret space prior to the Space Force being announced? Uh, Solar Warden was the one uh, discovered by that young man in Britain, in England, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, that's, that's an absolutely authentic situation because he, he had the proof, he showed the proof. And uh, he had uh, that that was being done. That was being done, and he hacked the materials, and he showed what he found. And so, yeah, that was an absolutely authentic situation. And also, you know that by the way the governments went after him, <laughs> went after him at that point. That really tells you that his stuff was authentic, and that Solar Warden was absolutely true, I and mean, it was absolutely subs substantial. I mean, it had the stuff, the proof in it. And so, yeah, there was a. That was the first real indicators that there was a secret space program, and that it was real. It was real and true, and uh, so that's why the uh, cabal had to uh, had to then, you know, get into gear and cover that up, cover it up fast. Do we have uh, bases on the moon and Mars right now? Mm, when you say we, you mean like, uh, humans, like human yeah. beings, yeah, yeah. Uh, I. I don't believe we do on the moon uh, because we have been under prohibitions from uh, going to the moon since 1977, I believe, uh, and that prohibition has held uh, has held uh, very firmly. Uh, who, by uh, whatever whatever alien forces were actually on the moon, it appears uh, it appears from from the proof that we have had. Uh, it appears that uh, there was some kind of alien force on the moon that suddenly restricted all humans from traveling to the moon after, I think it was 77. And, uh, and that has held tight. So I don't believe we have uh, bases, uh, human bases on the moon, uh, even to this day. And I don't even believe that. Uh, I don't even believe that we're still allowed to travel to the moon, even at this point. Uh, despite the fact that China and India have made a big show about that they could go up there and all that. Um, but on, on Mars, I've seen, I've seen a lot of evidence that we actually do have some kind of human basis on Mars, strangely enough. And one of the reasons for that is because that does not depend on human technology, rocket technology. Uh, that depends on these uh, jump platforms, these jump platforms that use uh, teleportation technology. Ah, well, real quick, based on what you said about the moon, you actually conferred what, uh, confirmed what I've heard for years, that we were told to get off and not come back. Uh, so oh, that, And uh, now, also, I've interviewed a few people who talked about going to Mars in these jump rooms uh, or portals or stargates, whatever people want to call them. Uh, I, couple names I'll say, well actually I'll just say one, everyone else can use your imagination and go through my channel and I'm sure you probably know who I'm talking about, but one of the names is Corey Good. So, uh, so I'm sure you've heard of Corey Good, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and so when he talked about essentially being taken to Mars like in a split second in a through a portal or there's another person whose name begins 
with, uh, is is Andy. I, you know, his last name starts with a B. I, I, I'm not going to say it for personal reasons. Um, but he talked about a jump room right by LAX. And uh, me, Blake, and Brent from Third Phase of Moon went and filmed out there. And, of course, everyone told us there is no jump room at that location. Um, I don't think they were lying. And if there really is a jump room in that building, I don't see why they would even know. But that, is your opinion that there are these portals or jump rooms around this planet that are natural? Or are the ones that potentially take us to Mars, are they man-made? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Well, yeah, I, I do believe that the, the jump rooms uh, do exist, the jump platforms. I do believe that they exist. Uh, uh, and uh, I believe that they're real. Uh, whether they are man-made is another question. I don't know that for sure. They, they could all be uh, alien technology. Uh, it's, it's very possible. Uh, but um, Keep the right, only thing I know for sure is that they exit, actually do right. exist and they are being used. Uh, let me get a couple more questions and let me announce exit, this. Anybody right. in the chat, if you have more questions, now's the time to start writing them in because after I ask my couple, I will go ahead and ask yours until we run out of time, which essentially is any time from now to the next 25 minutes. We're not on a hard clock because I did tell him an hour to an hour and a half. We are at 90 minutes, so we'll go on for a few more minutes. Uh, we can go up to 30 more minutes, people. Just I'll leave the questions up to you. So this question is about your own personal encounters. Can you talk about them without violating your NDA? Sure, I can. Uh, depend which which encounters are they discussing. Well, let's. What was your first encounter? What year and what were the circumstances around it? Oh, my uh, first encounter with uh, alien visitors. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, sure. That's uh, that's uh, something that I, I uh, talk about. Uh, I was I was about I was, geez, I don't I couldn't even tell you what year it was, but I was 10 years old, and I was in New York City. And that was when I was, my parents took me to a, took me to a, a party, a party that was in New York City somewhere. It was a great big hall and uh, me and a bunch of other kids uh, just uh, got together and ran out. It was, like, it was about one in the morning uh, and it was way late for us. But we got together and we ran out into the streets which were pretty much deserted. Uh, there were just two tall buildings out there and the kids were playing kind of rough. Uh, one of them, one of the bigger kids uh, hit me in the stomach. I went down on the sidewalk and uh, just, and then one of the kids yelled out, uh, he's, he's right. really hurt. And then so exit, they all ran right. away and ran back down the street into the, back to the rented hall that was uh, continuing the celebration exit, right. for the adults. And so I stayed out there, I was by myself. I looked up into the sky, it was, again, it was, it's about one in the morning. It was black sky. Turn left. I couldn't even see any stars. And I looked up between these two tall buildings that were the only things in the area. And I looked up and I saw a black ink cloud. I mean, that's the only way I could describe it. It was like an inky sort of black Go straight cloud on. way up in the uh, sky. Beyond any capability. And then from the bottom of that cloud of ink, uh, which blotted out the stars, I saw this lights come out the bottom of this this cloud of ink it came out and i saw the lights come out and then i saw this sort of this flying saucer thing and it had lights spinning in the bottom and it appeared appeared metallic in nature and it just came down towards me as i was looking up at it i was like frozen and then it hit me with that blue green spotlight that i have heard many witnesses talk about since then you know, that green blue spotlight that just kind of just went through my entire body like it was examining me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet and uh, then it went through me and then uh, two girls two teenage girls appeared on my on my left and they were <laughs> they were looking up at the sky looking up at exactly what I was looking at and they were screaming and trying to hug each other at the same time and they yelled at me 
little boy, you better you better run home because the world might be ending right now. And oh. So let me ask you this: If so, okay. When you said they appeared at first, I was wondering if they were non-terrestrial, but based on the reactions, it sounds like they were human. Now, right. did you not see them appear? Because do you think it's no. possible that maybe you had missing time? Uh, it's anything's possible, but they. I I was there in that moment, and I was just totally focused on the vehicle, on the thing up in the sky. Uh, so I didn't really, I didn't really know about their, and plus I was in that spotlight as well. So I was not aware of them at all, uh, or any people on the streets. It was abandoned. It was completely abandoned uh, until they yelled, until they yelled out, top of their lungs, and that's when I, I looked over and I knew that they were there, and they just yelled that out at me. They said, "Little boy, you better run home. The world is ending," and. When they yelled that out at me, I kind of, I startled, and I startled back to, back awake, and I kind of, I stepped back out of that spotlight. I took a step back, and as I did that, the craft reversed course in almost exact, at the exact same moment that I stepped back. Finding a it new route. course, it went back up into the sky, back, back up. It was going Get back ready up, to turn and right. those two girls took off. I mean, they were gone. They took off running, and they were gone as this thing just went back up into the ink cloud. It disappeared into that black ink cloud that was up there, and then the ink cloud itself also disappeared, and then I just ran back, ran back down the block to the uh, back to the rented hall turn to right. get back and tell my parents about what happened i uh, how you were they said you were a little boy how old were you 10 years old and after that uh spotlight that that greenish light came and was scanning you after you went home and in the following days and weeks and months did you notice any effects like blisters on your skin or any enhanced abilities or any sickness like fatigue or was it you were fine I, what I noticed was about a week, a week or so later, uh, I had a, uh, we had an alien visitation to our home. Uh, it was, it was almost like uh, that craft took back my resume to, uh, to the alien visitors and they, they said it was okay, whatever they found on that uh, spotlight examination that they did. And uh, we had a bunch of, a bunch of these uh, gray, gray creatures that uh, came into our home at about about uh, three in the morning one night. You and, uh, have uh, officially become my new favorite FBI agent and actually my new favorite of all <laughs> the, uh, you know, people I've interviewed in the federal government, uh, even more yeah. than Bill Binney, the uh, NSA whistleblower prior to Snowden. So I want to thank you for that because I actually, not only do you have the credibility and are really cool and nice, I generally think that you possibly may have been abducted, if not at least having that contact more than once and seeing the gray beings in your home is not something you would normally hear from a federal officer and someone who has a JD because not all federal agents have a JD. Get Usually ready to if turn they have right. college, it's just the bachelors and then they join. To get your bachelors and then your JD and then join is, you know, usually, uh, you know, someone like uh, Turn Comey, right. I would think, would be, oh, uh, you know. Don't mention Yeah, I, I know. I, I didn't want to think of, I couldn't think of anyone <laughs> else, but yeah, yeah. I, I'm in your camp. I didn't even want to say his name. Now, I'm going to save the other encounters for our next interview so I can get to these questions because fortunately, a few have piled up. So let me go in order to the la uh, last question. Uh, the Rapid fire. Let's yeah. Shoot him okay. This is from Anthony. It says, "Will Biden release disclosure?" Uh, never. Mostly because Biden doesn't know where he is right now. He has no clue. <laughs> Keep right, <laughs> and then exit um, right. This question is hard because it's just two words with a question mark. Um, exit Karen right. Seven. If you could re-ask this as a full question, I uh, maybe if Mr. D'Souza can answer it, great. But if not, if you can turn re -ask left. It, I'll get back to you. So this reads, Project Horizon, question mark. 
Project Horizon. I've never heard of that. Okay. Don't know what it is. So, uh, Pyramid, if you could rewrite that, I will re-ask it for you. Okay, let me get to the next one. Okay, this is... Um, hmm. No, I don't think... One of these disinformation platforms... Ah, well, this is not so much of... I guess it is a question, but... Um, Sean McCarthy, 86. So, do you think Super Soldiers Talk could be one of these disinformation information platforms? I don't know about the uh, the actual platform, uh, but um, you know, I see the I see the Super Soldiers uh, discuss their their material quite a lot, and uh, you know, I, I tend to not really see any proof in the stuff that they talk about. I don't see the I don't see the sauce, as we would say, on uh, on uh, 4chan and other places. Uh, so I tend to shy away from uh, the super soldier stuff, basically, in general. I'm with you on that. I, jeez, uh, must have been eight years ago at this point. I was invited to a super soldier conference in uh, Henderson, Nevada, uh, put on by Lorian Fenton. And I have to say, there was Oof. not a single person who told a story, but was able to back it up with any evidence the only evidence yeah. they offered was what they spoke which if their character is somewhat flawed then obviously i had to question it so i'm with you on that I'm one sorry. okay next question here is uh this is from jose sanchez do you know anything about the tr3b Keep and right is it based and on then ET turn technology right. i don't believe so the tr3b is a real thing and it exists but Turn I don't right. think it's a perfect, but it's not a perfect match for the giant black triangles that we see, that we saw in Phoenix in 2008. Uh, and then again in the later, I think it was like 2016. Uh, it's It doesn't match perfectly. It doesn't match perfectly to those giant black triangles. I mean, it doesn't equal them in size and it doesn't equal them in abilities either. Um, so, you know, the TR-3Bs, I mean, they're real. They're, uh, they exist, and they're they're st I think they're still top secret technology, uh, but um, to but they're not, right. they don't explain the giant boomerangs, the giant triangle, black triangles that have appeared in so many places across the United turn States, right. and that have the ability to move slowly over major cities, and then also have the ability to disappear to a little dot on the horizon at another point. So it just uh, doesn't match up. I, I'm with you about the Phoenix Lights. That craft um, was an estimated a mile you wide. You have arrived at your exactly. destination. Your and, raft uh, exactly. like, it, is now traveled, finished. like you said, very slow. Now, right. two or three Bs, absolutely, I believe they exist. They have not shown us any uh, videos. Uh, like, for instance, after they announced we had the SR-71, it was just a handful of years after they released the stuff. That had been 30 five years if i'm not mistaken eight late 80s or so or maybe early 90s so yes i would think that we've been working on some craft that is secret and i would think that is the tr3b but not a mile wide that's just uh right. my opinion okay right next question from you is let's see um okay this is also from anthony uh, just username anthony are the gray aliens the future us forced to live underground due to nuclear war time traveling in time to gather our dna so they can reproduce no they're not they're absolutely not because uh they would have given us some indication that that is the case if that had been the case 